This episode of Bond Park is brought to you by Google Waterloo. Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. As Google's Canadian engineering headquarters, Google Waterloo is a proud member of the Waterloo region and community. Thanks, Google. Welcome to Bond Park. I'm Sarah Geidlinger. And I'm Marshall Ward. Every year, Technovation invites teams of young people from all over the world to learn the skills needed to solve real-world problems through technology. And in the first episode of Bond Park's two-part series, Girls for Change, we're going to chat with grade 10 Cameron Heights student Ellen Brisley about learning how to build a mobile disaster relief app. And that's a project she started with fellow student Leah Uman at KW Bilingual School. We also speak to Cassie Myers, the proud mentor for Ellen and Leah's Ayudo Technovation team. Cassie is the founder of Lunaria Solutions, a diversity, equity, and inclusion tech company in Waterloo. We're also talking to Jennifer Scotchmer, the grade 7 and 8 English teacher at KW Bilingual, and she shares insight on working with students and challenging their way of thinking to see new perspectives and ideas. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome, Welcome to, to Bond Park. Park. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome to Bond Park. <laughs> Do you enjoy Bond Park Podcast? If so, we would really appreciate it if you leave a review, like, rate, subscribe, but most importantly, share directly from the platforms with your family and friends. That's the best way to get the word out to everybody and more people will get to see our show that way. So click those like buttons and share our show. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> On with the show. This is it. Here we go. Yep. <laughs> Ellen Brisley, thank you so much for joining us. It's good to meet you. First, I want to start with, how do you and Marshall know each other? So I remember Ellen from when she was in grade four. And Just I've, a little baby. I've told her this story, I think, a couple times now. But uh, I was uh, I'm very involved. At, I was very involved at Kitty Bilingual School as a parent and volunteer. And I saw Ellen give her grade four, grade four speech on Paris. I think you had traveled to Paris. Is that right, Ellen? Yeah, my family's yeah. French. And I hadn't really oh, wow. seen Ellen before, but she, she walked up and she had this uh, Parisian, like, red and white striped shirt on, and then this um, the beret, the black hat. Did you have the side scarf, too? Maybe. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but anyways, Ellen's speech on Paris just left me completely awestruck. Yeah. It was so good, and it was delivered like, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, could you imagine if adults had this kind of confidence that it, it was perfection anyways i think i got to see you do it a second time maybe in the gymnasium did you go on to yeah yeah and, and uh, she's gonna perform it right now yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then um and then the years went on and uh, i would see ellen at the science fair and, and saw what great work she was doing and also i got to interview her when she was in grade eight um for when the kw bilingual school hung the rainbow flag mm -hmm. And she uh, she talked about that. One of the uh, the vice principal, I think, picked Ellen to, to chat with me about that. And uh, and then I've seen her in Operetta a couple of times. And uh, we recently connected again for an article on Technovation in the Wilder Chronicle, which is what we're going to be talking about. Perfect. What's Operetta? Uh, like, uh, like the school musical. Oh, play. cool. Yeah. yeah, so let's talk about Technovation, Ellen. <laughs> yep. Take us back to the beginning and when you first heard about Technovation. So Leah and I have been friends since grade four when she went to KW Bilingual School. And in grade seven, Madame El Kibi, so our math and science teacher, told us about Technovation. And we started then and did it every year. So we did grade seven, grade eight, and grade nine um with different projects each time and we're back here again <laughs> so it's a coding program competition where they get girls to go into the tech industry and create an app and create a business and a pitch and it's a really good program so i've had lots of fun doing it these past four years so i'd done lego league before mm -hmm. but i actually hadn't done much coding that year so this was my first time really touching a program uh, and i'd never really thought about it before 
So it, it, it was the thing that started me onto tech. What program are you living in when you're when you're doing your coding? Java, and this year we're learning Swift. So it's in between uh, Android and iOS development, but it's mobile development. And I want to talk a little bit about that competition process. So like you said, you have to come up with a business plan. You have to come up with an idea. You have to do that pitch. I've seen the pitch video. It's awesome. Why don't we talk a little bit about the inspiration for your app and the name of your app? Ayudo. So Ayudo means help in help Italian. Help in Italian. That's what I was going to ask you. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> I think that's yeah. a beautiful. I think that's a beautiful connection there. How did the name come about? Leia and I were on Google Translate, struggling <laughs> to find a name for this app, yeah. and <laughs> we just decided to try a bunch of a bunch of languages for the name help and Ayudo sounded cool. It's not a great story. It's just, <laughs> I think I like the way I, it sounded. And I was looking for your app online. And for some reason, I, like that name, that word came up first, right? Mm -hmm. Ayudo, Ayudo. I'm probably not saying it right. Say it again. That's good. Ayudo. Ayudo? Okay. And I thought, oh, it's the word for help in Italian. And then I was like, oh, duh, this is obviously why they, why they picked this word. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. But let's, for anyone who doesn't know, let's talk about the process, right? So, so here you come up with this pitch. What was the inspiration for the idea for this app? So I guess it all ties back to aid, which is an app we made in grade eight. So Leia went to India uh, to see her family in Kerala and there were floods there. And she noticed that uh, the organize, the disaster relief process is pretty unorganized and it can be quite complicated. So that's what sparked our idea. And then, so we did that in grade eight and we came back to it in grade 10. So right now, and kind of changed its direction. So it, it is a different app, but we changed the direction. So it's still disaster relief, but it's more focusing on the organization and donor relationship. When you start Technovation, you just have to kind of come up with an idea out of nowhere. So it does take some time. Um, but luckily, we had that inspiration from Kerala. And so now we just we've done more research into the problem and changed our our scope and our direction to fit Ayudo. How does the whole process work in terms of you're, uh, you're in school and then this is how it has to be done outside school, obviously. And but there's there's people kind of supporting you and helping you along here. How does that work? And who are these people? Yeah, so we got Cassie through the Technovation website because they have a list of mentors that are available. So we got her through Technovation and we meet up once or twice a week and discuss our direction, discuss what we're going to do that week. And then Leia and I work, I'd say, three times a week on what was assigned and, and what we decided we need to do that week. And then we meet up again, we discuss our results or, or what we did or what needs to be changed. And it's just an ever changing process, really. And so we got Amina in January through Cassie. And so she signed up to be a mentor on Technovation. And so she's helping us with the tech side of things. And Cassie is helping us with the business side of things. So it's a really holistic project because we have people with different experiences. And just like any good collaboration where you might have a gap where you haven't thought of something, that's where someone else or the mentor might fill in or vice versa. You might be teaching your mentor something, right? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I hope Maybe. so. <laughs> We're getting them to ask new questions. Uh, there was an article recently about you guys using a long-term care facility as a local example of how Aido will bridge the gap between what people need and what um, people are willing to give, right? Yes. So tell us a little bit about that. So we met up with Cassie in October. October, and we needed a way to test out this idea and to see if it was really a problem. So we decided, you know, especially now with COVID, uh, people in retirement homes don't really have access to the outside world and they're not getting many gifts for Christmas. So we decided that that was a good way for us to try out our process. And so we didn't have the app by then. So we kind of made a mock-up of the process on our website. Um, so that was really done to understand donor behaviors and organization behaviors and just get a better idea of how things work so that we can make our app the best it could possibly be. And what did you learn? We learned a lot about donor, donor behaviors and just how they interact with the software. So we learned that, you know, you need the least amount of steps possible for them to donate in order for them to donate. So it, it was really interesting to see. We also at first only started with resources and then halfway through decided to change to money as well. 
And it was really interesting to see how many more people were willing to give money. So that really helped us decide that we needed to provide both options in our app. And then, I mean, it was it was really good to see because we talked to the organizations afterwards and it was really good to see that they found the process on their side quite simple and very helpful. And I think honestly, the best thing for me was hearing the stories of people saying that it was the only gift they got on Christmas or, or one lady cried when she received it. And in the end, that's really what we want our app to do. And so that was just such a good thing to hear from the organizations afterwards. That's a so beautiful I think, thing. yeah, I think we might end up doing it next year as well, maybe with the app. What kind of information were you able to collect to learn from there? So first of all, we did a survey afterwards. So we got some hard evidence there. Um, but I wrote, so I wrote down every single mistake that happened um, while people were using our software so that, you know, we could troubleshoot later on. So that was one of the biggest things. I wrote down every possible thing I had to fix or struggles that people had. So that's definitely important thing. And uh, we also use something called MailChimp. So you can see there how many people click onto your emails. And so you can see, you know, what titles work to draw people in or, or what needs to be said in the email so that people understand what we're trying to say. So those were important things that we pulled from, from our pilot as well. I like that approach to problem solving. You got to learn mm -hmm. from your mistakes, right? But an app needs to be intuitive. And so there's a lot that goes behind the user interface and the design. So we put in the effort to make sure that people don't make mistakes on our app or that it's the easiest possible use. Can we talk about your collaboration with Leah? Um, I've collaborated with many people over the years on various projects, and I find that, you know, it can go well, you know, for the most part with many different partners, but only once in a while is, it's almost magical when something works really, really well together and two people can work together for, let's say, several years on and off kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, can you talk about working with Leah and how that works and how you kind of divide up the work and how you make decisions together? Yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do if I need to work with someone else other than Leah, because <laughs> it's a good her and I, yeah, I mean, the, the basis of it is the friendship. So whenever we do call or meet up, we're having a good time. And I think that's important because it keeps us productive and, and makes us want to work. So that's the first thing. Um, but I'd say we have the same, we have the same work ethic, which is really important in a, in a partnership. Um, and we decided that we don't want to designate certain work to each person. So we want each of us to work on every single part of the app. And so that way we get our input on everything and it's as good as possible. So, you know, the coding we do together, the business we'll do together, the pilot we did together. So everything we do, we do together. And I think that's really important so that the app can be the best as possible. So not to say that we don't have disagreements. I mean, I think every partnership has them. But I mean, it comes from a good place. We just want the app to be as best as possible. And we both know that. And as friends, we know how to work through disagreements. So in the end, I mean, we always come to a conclusion and we always end up being happy with the product. And I think that's so important. And just reassessing how we both feel constantly so that everything can work smoothly. Can I just backtrack and I want to know, like, you mentioned that the app needs to be intuitive. That's a word I throw around all day in my job. Uh, this isn't very intuitive. You have to do this or do that. And it, what goes into making it? I, I know intuitive in technology when I'm experiencing it. And I know when I'm not experiencing it. But I have no idea what goes into creating it. Leah and I always go back to Instagram or Google Maps to see how it works um, in those apps and how they have made it intuitive. So we do base a lot of our stuff off of other apps just understand what we're used to, where to click, you know. Um, but also we make prototypes. So we're using an interface called Figma where you can make interactive prototypes. And that way we can uh, get other people to use our app and get them to work through every single part of the app so that if there are any blips, we can fix them. Uh, and, and that's basically the process. I don't understand anything really about coding. Can you? <laughs> I was hoping you were going to say, I don't understand anything we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I find it all fascinating, but uh, I come at it from a very, like, from an arts background. <laughs> For sure. And uh, I, I want to say that I recognize that uh, 
Ellen and Leah's education at KW Bilingual School, which I want to talk about too, um, is a very well-rounded one, I think, which is a huge part in shaping their, who they are today. But uh, let's stay a bit technical for now. And can you give us in a nutshell what coding is and how it works? Oh, man. Nutshell coding. Here we go. Nutshell coding um, with Ellen. <laughs> well, so for the first few years, we didn't really do much coding. So this is kind of the first year where we've decided that we want to learn coding and really put our hands into the app and, and make something from us. So right now we've done two courses. So we're learning Java and Swift, and those are both programming languages. So you will tell the computer what to do in a certain language, and then it will compile it and do exactly what you told it to do. Um, and so, I, I mean, Leah and I are both in a learning on a learning curve right now, a very, very fast one. <laughs> there are many coding languages, mm -hmm. more than Java and Swift yes. choir. Um, and you, this is your first experience with either of those, right? Mm. Those are very specific to mobile. Well, not only, but you use those two mostly for mobile development. And so that's what we need to do for Technovation and what we plan to do for IUDO. So that's why we're using those old languages. Is there some script? I've done a, like a teensy bit of coding just for Autolisp. But the only time I would ever use it was taking some pre-existing code and changing a piece to do what I wanted. Um, is there any of that a bit available to you? Or are you writing this language kind of from scratch as you're, as you're moving forward? Yeah, the internet is a huge place. So yeah. <laughs> lots of, of code that's already written that can be implemented into our app. And there's lots of APIs and things, code that's already written that can work in our app. So we don't have to start exactly from scratch because I don't think there would be much development in the coding world if everyone had to <laughs> write each line, you know? Ellen, your education at KW Bilingual School, let's talk about that. And from my vantage point, um, I, I don't think a, a project like this comes about without really well-rounded in individuals coming at it. And what I mean is um, the fact that you have these effective speaking skills that I've seen from you and Leah, and uh, the fact that you're participating in things like Operetta. And uh, just, it's, it's, um, it's, it's so much more than technology, right? Can you talk about that, your education, maybe from maybe grade five on at KWBS and how that all helped shape this? Yeah, from grade five onwards, we did lots of big projects that took months to do. So that requires a certain work ethic <laughs> and determination. And so that's what I think KWBS provided for us. And also I, I personally, and I think Leia too, love to do performances. So I'm a singer, Leia's a dancer. And so of course that helps with public speaking and just comfort confidence. with other people and confidence exactly. So that's also been a big determination in, in how we act and, and technovation. And what role did Madame Elkibi play in this? this? She would have been your math and science teacher in grades seven and eight? Yes, best yeah. math and science teacher ever. <laughs> uh, I didn't really like math until grade seven. So I didn't really, I was, I was good at it, but I didn't really enjoy it until I had Madame Elkibi. And it's just been a really eye-opening experience with her because she just made it fun. And she was really good at, at keeping us engaged and she also you know she's the one who showed us technovation so that was a, a a pretty big deal but uh i think she just gave me personally the confidence to believe in my math and science skill, skills um which is really important tech in technovation of course so i love her go meta mckeevy <laughs> and then uh, mrs scotchmer who teaches grade seven and eight english uh, mm -hmm. i think of she's such an unassuming teacher not quick to you know, pat herself on the back, but I think she has done an incredible job in um, helping shape just good people out of mm -hmm. her students. And, uh, and it's really important to her, things like community and caring and kindness. And can you speak to, about Mrs. Scotchmer at KWBS? I agree. She, she's never once judged me, never once. And that always made me feel like it was a comfortable environment for me to experiment and ask stupid questions. <laughs> um, and that's really helped me just feel comfortable in my academic learning. So she's been, yeah, an incredible influence on me. What was the outreach that you guys were hoping to have when you started talking about what this app can do? 
I think it was a little abstract when we first did it for Technovation. But as soon as we started working on it this year and we did the pilot, it feels like it can have a more local impact or it can reach organizations that don't really have a way to communicate with their donors. And so that's, I think the pilot really helped us see that it can help people and that it can actually be used. So I think that's been a really good thing to see. It's one thing to come up with an idea and it's another thing to understand if that idea is ex executable, really, right? Exactly. Yeah, I, I think it's been really, really good for us to see that this can go outside the scope of Technovation and this can be used. And you're a grade 10 student now at Cameron Heights. Tell us about high school and what that looks like. Take us kind of into Cameron. I know this past year has been uh, strange because of COVID, but um, when you first arrived at uh, Cameron, did it feel like a good fit for you as a student? And what kind of courses have you been taking? Yeah, I think it's been great. I'm in the IB program right now. So I'm in currently in pre-IB. Um, so that's been a good academic environment for me. And I'm, in reality, we only did have a semester of actual school, <laughs> which is strange to think about. But I made great friends who are all academically motivated as well. So that's been really helpful to me. And lots of great clubs, lots of math and science classes. And so I've had a good experience at Cameron Heights, for sure. I even joined, this year I even joined the school newspaper. So that's been really cool. Oh, awesome. And they're still doing clubs. It is online, of course, but there are still ways over Zoom. So it's a little different, but there are definitely ways to meet new people. Um, I think the biggest thing that quarantine has allowed me to do is focus on stuff that isn't school. So I've done lots more math and coding on my own, so self-taught. So I think that's the biggest draw away from, from quarantine. And Ellen, yeah, there's been a few articles now. I, and I think I heard you guys on the radio a while back being interviewed. Um, is that something you and, and or you pitched the idea to me of writing an article about, mm -hmm. about you guys? Is that something where uh, that's something Technovation has said to you, hey, here's another component that you need to kind of explore? Or is that you guys on your own thinking, you know, we, we want to get some kind of validation here and we want to help uh, people know that we're what we're doing? Yeah, I mean, of, of course, media attention helps give credibility to your project, but Technovation has never explicitly said that you need media. I think it was us just wanting to get the, the word out on what we were doing for the pilot and Ayudo, just to get people interested in listening, because I think that gives us lots of motivation and it gives us lots of, lots of input on what, how the app should work and what it should look like and whether it's actually going to help. So I think that's been really good. And as we wrap up here, Ellen, um, can you kind of reflect back on your, all your time with Technovation now and uh, what kind of what some of the most rewarding parts of it have been for you and also where you think you're going with it? Where are you and Leia going, you know, in the years ahead? It's been really good. I've really enjoyed these past four years. <laughs> um, I mean, I've learned how to work with people. Um, I've created a great partnership with Leia and it, it is the thing that pushed me to start learning coding. So I think that's going to help me if I want to go into, I think any sort of engineering or CS or, or tech industry. So I think it's, it's been really important in getting me to start. Uh, so it's been a great experience. I, I think that I would also want to work in a business or own my own business later. And so Technovation kind of made me want to do that. And I think Leia and I, if this continues, would want to work on this for as long as possible. Um, maybe even do it as a co-op in university or, or do it once we're out of university. So it, it seems like a real possibility for the future.
My name is Cassie Myers. I'm a Waterloo Region local. I'm a founder of a local diversity, equity, and inclusion technology company. And I am the proud mentor for Technovation's team at IUDO. Cassie Myers, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to join you folks. We want to talk about Technovation, mm-hmm. about your mentorship with that program, specifically with Alan and Leah, who are the focus of this show. So I want to ask you about your company, Lunaire. You're the founder and CEO. This is a software company with a DEI sort of objective. So can you explain mm-hmm. to us more about what that means? Yeah. So at our at Lunaria, our mission is to help diversity, equity, and inclusion grow at small to medium-sized businesses by providing them the tools to really uh, to grow DEI in-house or diversity, equity, and inclusion in-house. And the way we do that is by uh, doing an audit of an organization's, uh, the state of DEI in an organization, and then using that audit to match them with online education to really grow employee capacity and then surveys to really track their progress. And so recognizing that DEI looks different for every single organization, and it should be different for every single organization, depending on your city, depending on the work that you do. And so we're really lucky and honored uh, that we get to walk alongside folks and and really resource them with the tools that they need to to do what they're already dedicated uh, to doing. And uh, please tell us about Technovation. Yeah, so I had the opportunity of getting involved in Technovation uh, three years ago. So I started just as a uh, a mentor working with some of the group teams on their pitches. And then I started leading as a mentor last year uh, with another team. And then this year I'm with uh, Leah and Alan with Ayudo um, working on working on their project. And Technovation is really an incredible initiative where they've created this curriculum and this program to match women, to match young girls uh, with uh, professionals in the technology space or in the startup space. So they can take their ideas around a social problem or their passion for a social problem and build it into uh, a solution or an app that they can then submit uh, to the Technovation Challenge. And so Technovation has a really great presence in Waterloo Region just from the university, but it's actually connecting teams all over the world. And so they really created a curriculum that can be sensitive to different cultural contexts and and what it means to be a girl in different areas of the world, but also really dive into that single problem of how do we ensure that despite systemic challenges and barriers, that girls have the resources to take the knowledge and the expertise and the skills that they already have and really put it into action through technology. And I think, you know, I'm a mentor, so I'm I'm not... um, I can't speak to all of Technovation, but to me, that's really what Technovation is all about. Uh, and it's been incredible to watch uh, the impact of the organization grow um, from being involved in a small way to being able to walk alongside this incredible team. So your business is specifically software. Um, and that's how you got started. Were you coding on your own before that? No. So I'm actually, interestingly enough, uh, a non-technical founder. And oh, so, so I, in, that is interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I did my undergrad in humanities, so peace and conflict studies and business with an economics minor. And it was through another organization that I started. I think at the time it was Ladies Learning Code, but now it's Canada Learning Code, which focuses on more older groups than, than Technovation. I had the opportunity to learn coding. And so I'm definitely a believer in that anyone can, can learn to code and look, learn technology. And there's no time that's too early or too late for someone to do so. Um, and so it's great, I think, even especially with, with Leah and Alan to watch them, um, you know, come with an interest and a dedication to learning coding, which is no easy feat, and, and watching them grow into those, uh, those positions and grow into their, their capabilities. I think that must bring a completely different perspective in the terms of what mentorship means for these girls, because mm-hmm. you're, you're guiding them and they're, they're already getting the, the training for the coding and, and for the tech and you're guiding them in these other directions that they might not have seen before. Yeah. And I think, I think that's, what's really interesting about technovation is that it says, okay, you know, there are technical skills that you need and building an app is complicated and there's all these languages and all these, this logic you have to learn, but it's also helping them understand really complex social problems and think about, okay, you know, who do I need to talk to and network with to understand this problem? When if I want to build a a business and I want to build a solution to it, what are some um, things I'm going to have to consider? And so the, the girls and the participants actually make a business plan around their social problem and they are they are evaluated on not just the technical component, but their understanding of the problem and their 
uh, proposal of a sustainable solution or a sustainable business or, or practice or organization to solve that issue. And so I think it really takes a holistic approach to what it means to be uh, both technical, but, on, but also entrepreneurial and um, really a problem solver, which I think it makes it a little bit more unique to some of the other opportunities that might be out there. I was so impressed talking to Ellen and Leah about um, how they uh, are learning all these skills that have to do with, um, well, one of them would be learning about donors. And mm-hmm. how how um, you have to make things basically as, as straightforward as possible, so that people want to donate and they don't find it too complex. Is that something that you introduce to them, or is that something they kind of part of the process they figure out along the way? Yeah, I always joke that, I, or not joke, but it's it's a great experience because I learned so much from from Leah and Ellen. And I think as a mentor, a lot of what I do is is really just guided discovery and in them having these ideas and having. Um, this this inclination or this feeling that something might be there and just walking alongside them as they discover that. And so a big piece of what we work on is them understanding their problem and also understanding that you can build the most um, technically impressive product out there, but getting someone to understand how to use it, user experience aspect, the accessibility aspect is so important. And so I think, you know, as they go along, they are able to to recognize or come across some of these questions. And I really see myself as a facilitator that helps them really find this, the answer that they that I can speak to from my own experience and, and my own expertise. Uh, but they ultimately, as you know, the incredible leaders that they are, have a lot of the answers inside them already. And then when they brought this app idea to you, what were, what were you thinking? Was this very exciting right away? Or were you like, is this developed yet? What, where, or can you see the gaps when these girls come to you with the, when these young women come to you with these ideas? Yeah. So Leah and Ellen, when I first met them, I was thinking, you know, these two are a, a force to mm-hmm. be reckoned with. Um, there's a lot of, I think, um, uh, like statements or sayings that you can say about, about young, uh, young women of that age and, and just the, the, how impressive that they are. And I think, for them, I was shocked at the the dedication and how well formed it already was. And so they had a idea previously, and this was kind of a reiteration or a learning experience beyond their previous idea. And so I have never had a group be organized this early. So that usually people start off in January and we actually started working together, I think in the fall. And so we had the chance to even, um, or they had the chance to even do a pilot before most of the teams are even getting started. And so I think for um, Leah and Ellen, there are some of the te- technical components and maybe more of the competition focused things that they need to uh, think about, like their business plan and doing more formal research. Uh, but I think that drive and even being able to, from I think it was September, October, we got together to run a pilot with, um, I think it was two or three old age homes in the region by the end of December, it, it is just speaks to uh, the kind of people or the team that I was then joining into. And isn't that sometimes the beauty about a great project? It could be a piece of music and something artistic or something technical where that idea has been in some form bouncing around, getting poked and prodded at for a number of years before it becomes this big thing, this big, beautiful invention. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. Cassie, what... What does mentoring give to you? I mean, we we talk a lot about community on this podcast and about sometimes the wonderful, selfish uh, fulfillment that you get from giving back to your community. What does mentoring do for you? I think there's definitely a lot of benefits to mentoring. And I can't remember who mentioned it to me, but it was a mentor I had who who said, you're always going to want to surround yourself with two people or people who are perhaps at the stage before you. Um, and people who are at the stage after you. And I think for mentorship for me is, you know, one, a great way to give back to my community as, as always. And, and even I think with Technovation, quite literally give back to the kinds of organizations that, that I use it as stepping stones to get to where I am today. Uh, but also that learning experience to think about, okay, when I was at that stage or, you know, years ago, when I was thinking about these things, what kind of questions were I, was I asking? Did I do these critical steps that they're going through now? And how can I learn from them? going through those experiences and take that that with me moving forward. And um, I think beyond that, just the, we meet on every Sunday, uh, every Sunday morning we meet and the kind of like energy and the fresh ideas and the, um, the kind of uh, spirit or vibe that I get from those experiences is, is definitely fulfilling. And especially in a way when 
Um, and I think this is probably said overdone many times, but the kind of like need for community that we're in right now um, makes this experience, I think, still super rewarding, even though, you know, we've never met in person and, and might not. My name is Jennifer Scotchmer. I'm an intermediate English teacher at KW Bilingual School, teaching grade seven and eight students. So grade seven and eight English at KW Bilingual School, I think of these as really uh, big years for these students. Um, I once heard Wendy Strong, uh, who is a retired English teacher at KW Bilingual, talk about how this is a, these years are when the students start to really have strong feelings about uh, issues and the things that they're passionate about and uh, and want to explore and uh, so can we talk a bit about gr teaching grade seven and eight students english and uh, some of the things that you see really kind of awakens their imaginations absolutely um it's really interesting to see them blossom in these age in this age i find i sometimes refer to it as the ugly duckling stage where they're not quite little children anymore but they're not quite adults and they're really trying to find their way. The the questioning of why things are, why are things this way? Why do they have to be this way? Why aren't things changing? Why aren't adults doing something? They come in and uh, they're very aware often of what's going on around them and they see the injustice and, and they want action. They don't want to hear why we can't do things. They want to move forward. They want to understand why things happen and change things. So it's really fascinating to watch them, you know, just grow everything they suck in things like a sponge and they they just push like and, and i know as a parent sometimes you're not so happy with the pushing but as a teacher i love that they're willing to challenge me and my thinking and also each other it's it's a really dynamic challenging interesting time for them and there's so much i think now with um, you know, not only are they learning and they're going through puberty and trying to figure out what high school they're going to and kind of looking at their path in the future, they're just incredibly well informed and passionate. One of the things that uh, Ellen mentioned when we were talking to her was what KW Bilingual School brought to her education was the ability to work on big, meaty projects. When, when she said that to me, it really spoke to me because just even in my adult life, even something like this podcast, like biting into and tackling a big project with a lot of moving parts really kind of keeps me awake and alive and, and on, on my toes, you know? Um, and what does that do for those students in this tender age where they're learning how to manage their time and how to meet expectations? What do those big projects do for them? I think those big projects give them a chance to grow, to test themselves. A lot of times initially they look at us like we have four heads and think that's not possible. I'm never going to achieve that. And then you work with them, show them how to do the backwards planning, how to meet those targets, check in with them. And, and especially like I know all teachers, they want their students to succeed. So you're giving them those stepping stones block by block to build that. And, for a lot of them, it's about having the confidence, right? Knowing and trusting in their teacher that their teacher is going to work with them in order for them to succeed. And I think just, um, it's again, going to um, <laughs> teaching, it's about the zone of proximal development where you're, you don't want to give them something too easy. You want to give them something that's challenging and pushes them a little bit further, right, kind of like right. me doing this podcast a little out of my comfort zone, right? And um I think giving them also projects that are relatable to the world around them. So if they're doing a research project, what is what are they passionate about? What can they take from this and apply further? Those kinds of projects give them something that uh, makes a difference to them in the sense of how can I take this and apply it to the real world? How can I move this? Why, why should I care about this? I think a lot of times as teachers, the biggest buy-in you're going to get from students is when you can show them that what they're doing is actually a transferable skill or ability and can move them to where they want to go. Yeah, I think something happens there where they realize that they can make a difference. I think up somewhere up until that point, they think, well, what am I going to be able to do to help change? But I think somewhere around grade seven, eight, a lot of them realize, you know what, I, I can play some role here and make a difference. No, no step is too small, right? Just a small act of kindness in one person's day changes that person's whole day so taking that small bit 
and are taking that, you know, that one step really pushes them to realize that there's more steps and what else can they do? And how does this ripple effect work outwards from that one act and how could they grow it? So it's very interesting watching them when they get that idea and take it further and realize that this is more impactful than they ever thought. It's really amazing to see them. Especially at a time when this might be the first time when they're really finding their voice. You know, we all develop at different ages and figure things out at different ages, but that, that might be the time when you're realizing that the world around you can be affected by you and that you are autonomous and you know you have that role to play. And then you're grasping at these little pieces of life coming your way to find your voice. It's amazing. I, honestly, I am often amazed by my students. Uh, watch the growth between grade seven, just coming in, you know, we kind of still think of them as grade six when they enter. And there's times sometimes when I'm reading their work and I would not have guessed that a student that age could have written that. Like when I first started teaching, I would never have believed some of the depth and just incredible critical thought that goes on. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's mind blowing. It's awesome. And they are so ready to make change. It comes through and everything. They're so passionate. And, you know, I think sometimes the texts we read also go through that, but then they also have, um, you know, in our school, it starts with looking at uh, even people like Malala, right? And I know in grade five, they look at Malala. Uh, this year, there's a lot of students, when Andrea Gorman read her poem at the inauguration, uh, we're working on a poetry unit in grade seven, and I had them just, I said, okay, practice presenting a poem. One student instantly went to that inauguration poem and, and recorded themselves <laughs> And I mean, for a student, that speaks to their passion and they, they want to see things move forward. And when they get so excited by a poet, it's incredible to watch these students. Something that blows me away about the Technovation Project that Ellen and Leah have worked on is how not only have they developed it and they're capable of uh, you know, putting together a little press release and that, but like Ellen would email me and say, Hi, Marshall, we're doing this. Would you be interested in writing an article for the newspaper about it? I mean, I didn't learn that skill until after university. I think I might have grabbed it last year sometime. <laughs> so so I, I, don't, I don't know if it's a combination of effective speaking <laughs> I, contests and other things they're learning in English grade seven and eight, but uh, do, you, do you have any sense of where this almost inherent ability to promote themselves is coming from? And I mean, in a very natural, easy breezy way, it doesn't feel the least bit they seem completely comfortable with it As, yes um ellen and leah two forces of nature they are um and and you know what every student that comes through has uh, leaves an impression right they they leave a mark on your heart every single one of them um but I think the effective speaking contest absolutely would be a benefit in that respect because they're used to standing up they're used to kind of game about their things, uh, they're promoting their ideas. And we've had, um, we do Socratic seminars where they have to prove their point with evidence. We've done some debate advertisements. So we talked about how would you persuade someone to purchase your product? And all of those things, and I know many other teachers do this as well. Like there are so many great teachers out there. Um, but I think all of these in combination with that effective speaking contest really give them the the confidence in order to you know to convey their point effectively and communicate their ideas and they are really well spoken i'm always amazed by the students who participate in that contest always every year i saw in your bio that you were a coordinator for the strong start program before working at kwbf yes and i volunteered for that well like long yeah. before i had my kids and it was so it was such a rewarding program to be a part of so i, I loved it i just want to tell wasn't you wasn't it incredible it was incredible and actually like it was i like, learned stuff you know like on how to how to communicate to kids in 10 weeks the difference in a child in 10 weeks mm -hmm. unbelievable but i think i think too um the way teaching has changed in the sense of you know, when we were kids, we learned it a certain way, but now we often explain the thinking behind it. There's a lot more, um, you know, including the students, including student voice and choice, including students in um, understanding why we're doing something. It's not just memorize this or do this. It's this is what our learning goal is, and this is how it's going to help you move forward. And 
it's the same thing um, with students who don't like to do public speaking. And I say, okay, but what do you want to do? Do you have any ideas of what you'd like to do or pursue as a, in, a, in the future? And if they're talking about how they want to be in business, I say, okay, well, you need to be able to uh, have, be credible to whoever you're selling to. So you need to be able to prove your point effectively. You need to be able to convey that clearly to whoever you're selling to. Like these tools, whether you're going to be a public speaker or uh, a business person, you need to be able to pitch your ideas. And so I think when we explain to students why they're learning something, how it's beneficial and what they can use it for and how no matter what they're going towards, they can use that skill. I think that makes a big difference. It's a lot more buy-in from the students. I think, I, and I think that's a big shift in education in the sense of, you know, uh, I remember my, <laughs> my father-in-law one time saying, well, why are you explaining that to my child? Like to, in reference to me explaining something to my child, I'm like, because they want to know why not. And sometimes explaining that, explaining that to them helps them understand why I'm saying, you know what, no, we're not going to do that right now, but maybe later we can. And, you know, occasionally I'll get the bartering with, well, what about, and I think that also helps children apply their critical thinking skills in the sense of, you know, this person said, no, how can I convince them that my idea or I, what I want to do is going to fit into that next step. So when we talk about reading, um, and this is something that was introduced to me in teacher's college. It was uh, Dr. Louise Rosenblatt in the 1970s. She came up with this idea of the transactional reader response theory. And the, the big idea, and this, I know every teacher is doing this because we talk about communication um, and making connections, and this is part of it. But the idea about it is that, you know, a writer writes the text and what we've experienced in our life and uh, what we've read before colors how we interpret it. So, you know, there's not just one right way to look at something. And this is kind of what I really try to drill into students. I want to know your perspective. This might be a text that's been around for 50 years or say Shakespeare, it's been around for hundreds of years, but what do you think about it? What's your opinion on it? And having them understand that, you know, their experience is valid and their interpretation is valid. It may not match someone else's it gives them that freedom to, you know, quote unquote, make a mistake or take a risk in their learning, but it also helps them understand that people are going to have different perspectives. And I think that's a really important thing that all teachers really work towards is having those students look for that. What's, what's there, what's not there. And, and then to build on that, I haven't done this yet uh, this year, but uh, the next term is an important, we're reading a book and it's about in both grade seven and eight, and it's about uh, looking at events, historical events through different lenses. Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop in 1990, uh, she said, books are sometimes windows offering views of worlds that may be real or imagined, familiar or strange. These windows are also sliding glass doors and readers have only to walk in, walk through an imagination to become part of whatever world has been created and recreated by the author. When lighting conditions are just right, however, a window can also be a mirror. Literature transforms human experience and reflects it back to us. And in that reflection, we can see our own lives and experience as part of the larger human experience. Reading then becomes a means of self-affirmation and readers often seek their mirrors in books. So I really love that too, because it's talking about um, how we can make those connections going, it builds on Rosenblatt's series, but it also talks about, you know, it's important for students to be able to see themselves, but also to gain that perspective of whose voices are being heard and whose voices are missing. And that's that critical thinking component where they walk in and they're, you know, looking at a history text, whose voices are heard? Well, the dominant culture, right? Whoever wrote the history book. So whether it's fiction or nonfiction, they have this ability to start thinking critically about what's being said, who's being, who's being heard and who we might want to go and investigate and find out why the other voice wasn't, wasn't shared. So, and then it, it also kind of shows them like who has the power in a certain era and what is a classic, why is it a classic? So we, we do a lot of questioning in that respect. This is Cassie Myers, 
I'm so happy that I get to work alongside the IUDO team. And there are a few ways that you can get involved and support their work. First is by giving them a follow on Instagram at IUDO Solutions, A-I-U-T-O Solutions, and then going to their website at iudosolutions.com and signing up for their newsletter. We welcome any and all community members and especially folks working in the nonprofit space. Hey, all Thanks for meeting us in Bond Park. Please like, rate, and subscribe to our podcast on the platform that you're listening to. And follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Bond Park Podcast. Original music by Alan Lung.